Hi, my name is Blake Horde, and my project is titled High Mass Planet Spiral Shocks as a Source of Infrared Emission in Protoplanetary Disks. So the big question is, how do planets form? Well, after a star forms in a nebula through gravitational collapse, the remaining gas and dust forms a disk around that star. In the center of this disk right here is what's called the disk midplane, and that's where planet formation must occur. In that midplane, the small molecules of gas and dust that were in the nebula have to grow and basically snowball into giant planets hundreds of kilometers across. When we model these systems and planet formation numerically, we see that high mass planets and planets in general form spiral features in the disk around them. So as the mass of the planet revolves around the star, it disrupts the disk. Just like if we imagine a motorboat going through the water, it creates waves going behind it. It's the same principle. There's a linear analytical theory to predict the shape or the pitch angle of these spiral waves, and it's dependent on both the mass of the planet and the sound speed of the gas that it's launched from. We have seen many times observations of such spirals in uh, disks. However, many of the spirals that we see, their pitch angles are too wide to be explained by the linear analytical theory. That theory suggests that these spirals must be launched from areas of much higher temperature than the ambient gas and dust around them. So as you see on the left in the system MWC758, the temperature that uh, that spiral in yellow must be launched from, according to the theory, must be about 300 Kelvin, compared to the surrounding gas that's only 30 Kelvin. While on the right in the system HD100546, uh, the same spiral in yellow is not polarized, implying its thermal emission on the order of uh, 450 Kelvin. To explain this high temperature and the differing morphologies, one explanation may be uh, high mass planet spiral shocks and the supersonic wakes that come from that. So as the mass increases, uh, the supersonic wakes are actually when those spiral arms travel faster than the speed of sound in the disk. The linear theory works very well for these low mass planets below the mass of Neptune, so right here with 0.01 masses of Jupiter. But as the mass increases past one mass of Jupiter, it, the morphologies diverge from the prediction. So in the uh, numerical simulation of Zoo et al. 2015, we see on the left the density structure of the disk, with red being high density and blue being low. Uh, the spiral feature matches uh, the analytical prediction, shown as the faint dotted line there. So it diverges from that analytical theory as the mass increases above one mass of Jupiter. On the right, in a simulation by Lyra et al. 2016, they did a simulation where they put a five mass Jupiter forming planet in a disk, and after 40 orbits, this is what the mid-plane temperature profile looked like. So as you see around the location of the planet right there is a, a region of high temperature, and just above it in its spiral arm that it forms is another region of increased temperature, about 200 Kelvin. If we look at a cross section of this disk, the simulation from Lyra et al. 2016, we see that around the location of the planet at 5.2 AU, inwards and outwards radially, there's a high temperature region of about 450 Kelvin. And as you may remember, that 450 Kelvin number is the same number required to launch the spiral in HD100546. However, there's one problem. In the observation of HD100546, that emission came from the atmosphere of the disk, that surface area, outside of the midplane, because it's a very optically thick and dense disk. However, here, uh, the, those high temperature regions are in the midplane, in the center of the disk. So we wonder why that is, why that temperature, high temperature is confined to the midplane. And it has to do with how Lyra et al. 2016 set up their simulation. So they set it up with a nearly adi adiabatic midplane and a nearly isothermal atmosphere. This meant that the heat was all trapped in the midplane and it couldn't, uh, it couldn't cool very effectively into the atmosphere. Um, and conversely, the atmosphere cooled very quickly, releasing all of its heat into the space around it. Uh, this is because they used an on-the-fly Newton cooling function that was dependent on the optical depth of the disk. This is an approximation. It's not entirely realistic, although it is close. And it's done because it is a very computationally expensive 3D hydrodynamic simulation. And if something more realistic were used, it would take much, much longer and be much, much more computationally expensive. 
But it is necessary to determine what the temperature is at, at this atmospheric uh, location in order to correctly compare this model to our observations of spiral arms and disks. So the problem then is that the model of Lyra L 2016 has an inaccurate cooling function that prohibits a comparison of their model to protoplanetary disks. To remedy this and provide observational evidence for whether their model can reproduce the wide spirals that we see in observations, a radiative transfer simulation was run on the output of their uh, simulation in order to improve that heating function in a post-processing routine. This yielded a new temperature grid for the entire disk space and allowed synthetic images to be made through ray tracing from that. These synthetic images were then compared to our actual observations to determine whether it can explain the morphologies. To improve the heat transfer function, I used a code called RADM C3D. It's a radiative transfer code that requires the input of heat sources within the disk. So when you input these heat sources, it models the direction and traces the path of every photon emitted from the heat source and models each individual absorption and scattering event with every um, grid cell in the disk. This means that it's a much more thorough treatment of the heat transfer than the approximation used in their original simulation. The input of the heat source was used as the shock heating rate. So the shock heating rate was chosen because it's unique to the higher mass planets, above one mass of Jupiter, where it forms the supersonic wakes. It's also because in this disk, it was the most significant source of heat. So as you see on the, on the left, in the mid-plane, that heat source function, the shock heating rate, forms a spiral feature, which if it can spread up into the uh, surface of the disk and the upper atmosphere, may form observations that are similar to HD100546. And on the right, we see that this shock heating rate was the source of those two high temperature regions of 450 Kelvin uh, alongside the planet. To transfer the data from the pencil code, which was the code base that Lara et al. 2016 ran their simulation in, into RADM C3D, a new pipeline had to be created from pencil code to RADM C3D. This was done through a series of Python scripts that transferred data such as the density seen here. And on the right, we see in that black box the location of the planet, and just above it in orange, a spiral feature of high density. After all the data was transferred, the RADM C3D code was run for 10 to the seventh photons, which yielded a new temperature grid, and then allowed synthetic images to be made. And here's what's one such synthetic image. It's made at a wavelength of 3.5 microns. It includes scattering, and its orientation matches that of the observation of HD100546. And what we see here in the yellow is that there is a high-intensity region that appears to be a spiral. However, around it, just above it, and to the right, there are other miscellaneous sources of, of intensity that aren't directly explained. What may explain it is scattering, scattering off of a high density disk gap outer edge at 8 AU. So the, the planet carves a, a gap in the disk, and the outer edge of this gap is very high density, so shown in red right there. And what may happen is that scattering of starlight off of that gap outer edge may cause this miscellaneous source of emission. If we increase the mass of the planet, it would increase the shock heating rate that we include, and then it would, uh, may cause the image to be more distinct, the spiral, image, the spiral feature to be clearer. So let's compare the two. When we compare the observation on the left, what we actually see in HD100546, to the synthetic image on the right, we see that there's a loose match. And I say that loose match because they both have distinct spiral features. However, on the right, it's very obscured by scattering. One thing to note, though, is that in the observation of HD100546, uh, the image is not polarized, the light is not polarized, so there must be no scattering or little to no scattering in the image. Thus, in order to provide a true comparison between the observation and the synthetic image, the scattering must be subtracted from the synthetic image. So, this study acted as a pilot study for future observations of um, high mass planet spiral shocks and translating theory into observation. It provides preliminary evidence for a second planet in the HD100546 system, whereas the first one is right here, HD100546b. However, this requires much more validation and confirmation because this is not 
uh, a validated way of finding planets with confirmed exoplanets yet. More importantly, it suggests that high mass planet spiral shocks may be observable. So we see that when we include scattering, there's a clear spiral feature that we see. However, we may be able to increase the resemblance to the image if we increase the shock heating rate. This would mean a variety of things. One, one possible factor would be an increase in the mass. So if we increase it from five, the planet's mass to, from five masses of Jupiter to 20 masses of Jupiter, about the size of a brown dwarf, it would deepen the gravitational well and increase the shock heating rate. Lyra et al. 2016 also used a smoothing radius to um, spread the mass of that planet outside of just one grid cell, because if we put five masses of a planet in one grid cell, it would break the code. So if we shrink this smoothing radius to, to smaller values, it would increase that shock heating rate and may provide a clearer image. Any other variations in the intensity may be explained by differences in density structures in the two disks, where the observation may have two planets and the simulation only modeled one. This research should be continued with other disks comparing uh, uh, synthetic observations to uh, LKCA15 with a new model, and the same pipeline between the pencil code and RADM C3D can be used for that. Most importantly, the scattering must be removed from the synthetic image in order to provide a true comparison. I'd like to thank the Siemens Foundation, George Washington University, Discovery Education, uh, my mentor, Dr. Vladimir Lyra, my teachers, and my family, and especially all of you. So thank you.